Did you know this toy is about 10 years old now? Time sure does fly when you're bitching on the internet. Now I know what you're saying. Another review of a VF1 Valkyrie toy? Yeah, but this is a little different, or it's a little retro. This is, in fact, the first VF1 Valkyrie as re that was released by Yamato Toys way back in 2001. And this is the one that everybody bitched about and then bought anyways. So I'm going to sort of take a look at uh, doing a bit of a retrospective on this toy. Um, kind of highlight the differences between this one and obviously the new one. And uh, talk about what this toy did right and what it did wrong and various stuff like that. Alright, so... First of all, you can't really tell over the camera, but this thing is pretty heavy. In fact, um, the entire shin section here, the kind of the main engine part, is actually die-cast metal. And uh, this does give it um, more of a heft than I would say even the old uh, 155th scale Takatoku toys that Bandai has been reissuing forever. The problem with this is is that because of the weight of the legs they are they are just locked in here with this tab and I'll show you that a little more with the transformation and one of the biggest problems with the transformation of this toy is that you cannot instantly switch from fighter to gearwalk mode because these things are in fact locked tight and you have to unhinge them and do all this stuff. I'll, I'll get into that later. Um, so this did actually set the standard for what would come with modern Valkyrie toys or your basic VF1 release. You got uh, underwing stores, you usually, usually get the the big missile, the big box micro missile launcher the cluster of three long-range missiles, and of course a gun pod, which stores on the bottom. And uh, with these first ones, uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but you can see that it is actually so far down and not completely against the the backs of the arms that it does kind of drag on the ground. Uh, what they did later with um, succeeding versions of this particular toy is that they uh, altered the gun pod so that it did have the collapsible handle as seen on uh, most of the newer Valkyrie toys. As far as details go, this thing has uh, very little tampo printing. Really, the most it has is um, the UN Spacey symbol on the wings, um, the numbers right here, because uh, actually this number, this UN Spacey symbol, um, this particular um, skull and crossbone symbol and uh, this UN Spacey mark are in fact all stickers and um, also you can't really see it on, on this camera but there is actually a sticker for the, uh, the cockpit for the detailing on the main display and these are those early Yamato stickers that weren't really cut right and they don't really adhere well I mean these have stayed on for as long as I've owned this toy but you know they do they do kind of peel a little bit and you can kind of see there it, it did peel a little bit um, okay, so the landing gear on this toy does not actually move and uh, doesn't really lock in place either, so if you did try to drag it around, it would probably collapse back inside. And uh, there's not really a whole lot else to say about this thing in uh, fighter mode. It, it did look pretty nice for the time. Uh, people weren't entirely sold on it, but for a little while it was the first modern VF1 Valkyrie toy because the last one that ever had ever been made in, in the, uh, I would say, the fully featured uh, deluxe size or um, just kind of like a full uh, Takatoku-style high metal release was the old high complete model, which has never been reissued because apparently they lost the tooling for it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to bring out the modern, or mostly modern, 160th scale VF1 Valkyrie toy, and as you can see, they are, because again, they are the same scale, 160th scale, 160th scale, they are about the same size. Um, this one is lighter, but again, everything about it, it just feels a lot tighter, more refined. Uh, one of the biggest differences between this toy and this toy is that the newer toy was designed uh, primarily using computer-aided design techniques. Well, this toy was in fact sculpted by a man named uh, Billy Wong, with some help from a design studio called Flex. So this is actually a bit more kind of handcrafted, uh, a bit more traditional, 
while this is bleeding edge, new, and um, really, really good. And this is a personal preference, but I do feel that this the blue here on uh, the newer toy is a bit nicer than the blue here. This is a little, little bit brighter, not quite as um, subtle and uh, appealing as this darker blue here. But you can see again they have the same accessories, and uh, this one did get it right where the the gun pod does slit flat against the the bottom of the arms, and uh, the underwing stores on this that they just go on with a little peg. And uh, you can see there's one of the problems there is that this little peg can sometimes get loose and they'll just fall off. Whereas on this one they do have a full clip system that goes right around the uh, the mounting point. So yeah, um, again the uh, new 160th scale toy did use the uh, 148th scale uh, VF1 Valkyrie toy as kind of a starting point and did. Um, refine everything from there and honestly there is really very little of this toy in either the 148 or this new toy it's kind of amazing they, they more or less completely abandoned almost everything about this figure when they were making these toys there is one thing that they both do the same and I'll, I will get to that actually no I'll just do it right now now you can see here you've got the little the way the tail fins work and this is sort of uh, Yamato's signature contribution to uh, VF1 Valkyrie design is the way it works is you have the tail is also a part of this little uh, cut out here so that makes the hinge uh, more or less like very streamlined just basically a part of the, the backpack area here and what you do is you just fold the right fin down and you fold the left fin over it and the left fin just has a slightly longer hinge so that it does fold nice and flat and that is the same on uh, this toy you just fold it over and there you go, it's nice and folded flat. So really that that is the one thing that they kept when making their new VF1 Valkyrie toys. So I'm going to take a quick break and we're going to go transform this guy into Garrock mode. Alright, now we're going to transform the classic Yamato VF1 Valkyrie into Garrock mode. Now somebody usually asks in the comments, um, how do you pronounce Garrock? Well, if you wish to be authentic to the way they pronounce it in Japan, it is um, Gaok. But for us uh, filthy foreigners, we can just just say Gerwalk, because it, it, it sounds alright like that. Okay, so we already have the tail fence holded down. And what we do next is we can bring up the backpack. And there's a little tab that actually does lock in and uh, keeps the backpack in place. Now you will notice that this backpack does not actually plug into the legs or even the arms like on uh, some other modern transforming VF1 Valkyries, so uh, all that's really holding it in place is friction. But I have found that with at least with this toy, which again is about 10 years old, it still stays in place even in, if I invert it. Now we can put the landing gear back inside. Probably the funniest thing about the way these are designed is uh, because the swivel is actually right here on the leg rather than you know up here in the thigh area, they had to split up the the landing gear doors in such a way that the the front door here does not actually need to be opened in order to bring out the main gear. So I just thought that was always kind of funny. And um, with the nose wheel, you just push it down. Try to stay in focus too. Push it down and then just kind of push it up. Now in fighter mode, this thing has never ever stayed closed. It's just there's some kind of misalignment with the way it's molded and with some of the paint on the the internal diecast uh, chest plate bar and other kinds of things that just make it not really stay uh, perfectly flush. And you want to retract it. Okay, so here's what everybody complained about back then, if you weren't around on the internet 10 years ago, is that for this for this particular Valkyrie tool, you do have to remove the legs for the transformation. And the way you do that is you just push forward this little uh, bump on the intake here, which unlocks the thing, and then you just 
bring it up and pop it off. And again, this is where most of the weight is in this Valkyrie toy. I mean, listen to this. Yeah, this this thing. You could you could probably hurt somebody with this thing. And you do the same thing on both sides. Now you may be wondering, well, why would they do that? Why would they want to make a Valkyrie toy where you have to take the, the legs off? Well, despite the fact that the VF1 Valkyrie is more or less the herald of what people call the perfect transformation toy, um, in where the, the actual toy you could buy was as close as possible to the a character you saw on screen, the VF1 Valkyrie always had a, little, a dirty little secret when it came to its transformation, and that's just in the way the legs actually transfer when we go to battle rate mode, when they go from underneath here to here on the nose. Now in the show and in the original design, there is actually just a flat panel that moves the leg all the way to the nose cone, and then the panel actually detaches from the the back of the intake here, and then just folds back inside, you know, leaving the leg attached to the nose. So in essence, what you're doing here with this toy is that same process, just without the panel that moves it, because, well, I guess it would feel kind of redundant if you had to move this part and then put it into the nose cone and then retract the panel yourself. It's kind of weird. No uh, toy has actually ever done that, um, having the actual panel like in the show. So uh, Yamato's first solution was to just have the legs to be removable so that you got more or less the same idea of taking the legs and then moving them somewhere else. Of course, this is Garrock mode where the legs just kind of go back to where they have to be anyway. Okay. So again, like any Valkyrie, you do take the, the gun pod out of the arms. And for whatever reason, this uh, gun pod, uh, this, we have one gun pod, I should say, the GU-11, for this toy, the midsection is just really skinny and tiny. It's just like, why is it? Why does it look like that? None of the other toys look like that. There's really no physical reason why it would look like that. It's just kind of weird. Oh, and if you ever wondered, you're supposed to put the, the sticker on like this so that it's right side up when uh, it's in fighter mode and upside down when it's in battle right mode. And then you just take these and they will plug in to little holes on the side of the Valkyrie. Now the problem with the way that this the gun pod's attached on uh, this toy is that it did, did leave this very nasty gap in the or an indent in the arms and what they gave you were these little fill-in pieces to make it look nice and smooth again. Now when they switched over to using the collapsible gun pod or the collapsible handle on the gun pod uh, they just had a much smaller indent, which uh, they didn't give you fill-in pieces for because it's much less noticeable. And uh, the problem with these little fill-in pieces is that, you know, they're a part you have to keep track of, and they are kind of small. They can easily get lost, and they only give you the one set for the arms. So then you just move the, the forearms into place, and with a classic slider, you expose the fists. Now this thing did have a fairly good range of nice ratcheted joints to give it stability. Also later versions of this toy actually had um, the proper little kind of accordion joint right there. Uh, the first one, the first couple did not have that part. And what you do is you just take one of the legs and you put it back onto that bracket or whatever and you just push the slide forward and you've got the leg locked in. Now there are a couple of problems with this whole idea. First off, the little sliding mechanism doesn't quite the legs in the, the proper position. And for whatever reason, despite the fact that um, these thighs would usually behave nicely in fighter mode, in uh, gear walk mode, for whatever reason, the two little hip joints that you're going to be using in battery mode just kind of knock into each other and you just kind of have to put one over the other. 
And here you can just stick the, the gun pod in the hand. Only fits in the right hand, as you can see. Uh, the left hand has no hole in it, so. For whatever reason, they thought that Valkyries are only right-handed. Uh, this did come with a couple of optional hands, uh, just one, a left hand, which, or left hand, uh, which was just, you know, open so they could cup the bottom of the gun pod. Then there was the infamous trigger finger hand that had no thumb. I'm not going to go into that because that caused a lot of debate back in the day. Needless to say, the case of the missing thumb will forever remain a mystery. So, um, even though this was, again, one of the, really the first modern VF1 toy, they didn't quite get the whole, like, A stance for Gearwark mode where the legs are kind of splayed out like this. Now, it does have swivels here, you know, right in the, the shin itself. I'm not really sure if these were what they meant to have to replicate the A stance. I mean, you can see it kind of gets that look. But they're, they're so low on the leg that they don't quite give you that, that appearance. Um, I have to rem really wonder if this was just for posing in battery boat and they just... Um, just were playing around with it and said, well, you can, you can do this in, in Gearwalk mode too to give the proper look. But let's compare it to the... The recent toy, which is a lot easier to transform. So yeah, you can see uh, now, despite the fact that these things are about the same size in fighter mode, this is a little bit bigger in uh, Gearwalk mode, the new one, I would say. Um, so overall, this this really this is this is a Gearwalk. Like this is what you think when you you hear that term Gearwalk, the walking airplane, you know, with arms, with that. Very aggressive looking bird-like stance, you know, the legs splay out properly for the A stance because they have a, a swivel right in the upper thigh. And um, also the, the gun pod looks nicer and um, like I said it uses the new collapsible handle that just fits into this little slot here. Although I will say the, the newer VF1 Valkyries, the, the gun pod doesn't really stay in. If you just attach it to one arm, you kind of need both arms to sandwich it in between to keep it um, held in place, and uh, also one big difference between these two toys is uh, this has no pilot, and this actually does have a pilot and also a, a working canopy, which is kind of stuck. Oh well, whatever. You've seen that in other toys. Um, they did later on put pilots into these toys. Uh, the first ones could not retroactively use the pilots because there was no uh, little peg for these little half pilots they put in here. This actually does have a full-size pilot figure. If there is one thing I do like that um, this figure did, this one did better, is I kind of like the shape of the backpack a little more than this one. Also, the the little detail they put in here is a bit um, a bit nicer. It's, it's a lot smoother. It's kind of a, a gray, great area rather than this where it looks a bit more like a, like a heat vent or, you know, your air conditioner or something. And uh, this, this actually did cause some debate because in the show, this area is blank. On the Takotoku toy, this area has uh, three little verniers. And uh, most of the model kits and the high complete model, they, this part was also just flat and blank. So a lot of modern toys have decided, modern toys and uh, model kits have decided to put something there so it looks nicer. Okay, so uh, we're going to take another quick break and we're going to go on to the, the final mode, which is Batteroid mode. Okay, so for the final part of this review, we're going to go and transform this into Batteroid mode. And uh, this is where most of the dreaded parts swapping and parts leprosy comes in with this toy. First off, you do have to pop off the canopy, and uh, this thing wasn't too pretty even in its day, because it has a big nasty seam right in the middle as part of the molding process. And you just replace it with the cockpit shield, Canopy cover and whatever else people want to call it. I've seen many different actual official names for it, so I'm not going to get into that. And uh, as you can see, that, that this thing is a little bit bigger than the regular canopy and does have a slot for the chest plate when we get to that. And also the skull and crossbones is a sticker. It's actually a two-part sticker. The head is one part and the two bones are another part. So, you know, I hope you're really good at putting stickers on. And then we do have to remove this little plug in the nose. 
they did give you two of these things just in case you lost one, but I was able to keep to both of them over the years. Oh, and one final thing I didn't mention the uh, the gearwalk part is that they did give you a little antenna to put up there, but it, it it's a little plastic antenna. It looks pretty lame. Okay, so we're gonna just unlock both legs again and let them clang against the table, and just put the arms like that. Take the gun out because that's not gonna stay in there. First off, we are going to lift up these two little pegs here. And then I'm just going to come up here, and uh, what you do is you just disengage this tab from underneath the chest plate, and just kind of bring the whole thing forward. Flip up the back plate, and obviously you got to turn the head around and feed it through. Now here's where this thing is kind of over-engineered. Uh, one of the problems with the original Takatoku is that sometimes the little clip that held the two halves of the airplane mode together would just get loose over the years because it was just, it was just a yeah, spring-loaded clip. So what they decided to do was to have three different ways this whole thing locks together. First off, when you bring it down, you're going to lock a couple of holes into those that peg, those uh, set of pegs you brought down. You're going to put this edge here, actually inside this part of the shoulder hinge. And then as you bring the whole chest plate down, you will sometimes dislodge these, the edge from that inside the hinge. And it's supposed to kind of keep everything together and it... Never really quite worked. And you just bring down the the wings, and you've got a Valkyrie with no legs. Because he, he lost his legs in Space Nam. And then you just slot these in. Again, this is that wasn't really a very painful process. It's just it felt a little more of a project than it needed to be. Okay, so this is a classic Yamato VF-1 Valkyrie in Batteroid mode. Now, I have to say, uh, the proportions overall, they're definitely um, a bit blockier than uh, some modern versions of this, this character. Uh, particularly the arms are, are pretty uh, chunky looking. I would say overall it, it does resemble the way it was usually drawn in uh, Mac Rusty Remember Love. Um, which, you know, is, is good or bad, whatever. I think it still does have the same uh, dignity that most VF1 toys manage to capture. And uh, I do always like the, uh, the VF1A style head because there's nothing more pure than one camera eye and one head laser. Um, one of the big problems that people had with um, the sculpting was just the, the nose cone itself. You can see it's very tapered, it's very pointed, you know. Some people call it the needle nose. Uh, the reason for this is because the intakes here have that sliding lock, the whole joint has to be external. And because the joint is external, you have this extra bulge in between, which means that to keep the, the hips, you know, uh, like uh, so they're not wider than the chest plate, because that's the, the, uh, the general proportions with the VF1 is the, the hips are, you know, about wi as wide as the chest plate, as you can see. They had to push the nose inward a little bit, just taper it inward so that there was enough room for, you know, this extra hip joint and then the, you know, the whole intakes and the legs and all that. Okay, so um, just to go into some of the articulation, um, one of the problems with the, the way these things lock so tightly into the uh, part of the chest plate there is that uh, on this one, this one is locked properly, this one is not, is that when you try to to pull this, this will just unlock the the hinge from the chest plate in there, and um, yeah, and then it kind of starts to, to force the whole thing apart, and then you just gotta pull it apart again, and then realign that, and then snap the chest plate down. And that was really annoying. Really, the problem was is that the ball joints in the shoulder were just 
uh, they really can only let it rotate. They didn't let it um, move in and out or any really anywhere else. So did have you know the standard uh, shoulder joint, you know, fully moving or swiveling elbow joint. It can only go about 90 degrees uh, bending on the elbow joint. Uh, one thing this thing does have that most Valkyries do not is it actually does have a, a waist joint. And this is the one advantage that having the legs separate from uh, the rest of the body helps is that with the legs just attached right here, you can have a fully functional waist joint and uh, that kind of lets you get the intake pass to the wings on the back without having to do some uh, additional muckery. Now, um, part of the, the problem uh, with this design is that because these only slot in with friction, it's very easy to just pull them out when you're posing it. So it's, it's not really an ideal solution. I will say I'm not totally opposed to uh, removable legs on a VF1 Valkyrie toy. I would say that this one just didn't do the, do the whole idea um, well. It, it just kind of did it badly, <laughs> uh, to, to, to put it nicely. Okay, so we are going to bring out the new guy. I'm trying to get both of these guys in shot here. And um, once again, like I said, they are the same size in fighter mode, but uh, the new one is still taller. That's just the wizardry of a modern computer-aided design that allowed this to happen. And um, overall, this isn't uh, not as blocky as this guy, but I would say the new one manages to capture the VF1 Valkyrie that you see in your mind. When you think back to the television series that the um, or the movies or anything else, this is the Valkyrie that most people think of. And uh, this is actually, this is pretty close to how it was drawn in the show most of the time. Not that there weren't, you know, very distorted and, and chunkier versions in the TV show, but for all those really nice action scenes, um, they usually drew it kind of like this. And uh, this guy is, well, you've seen the, the articulation on this guy, and uh, it, it is a lot better. I mean, for one thing, the, the the shoulders can actually swivel out and inwards, you know, they're on a full ball joint, everything goes up. The elbows have a nice double joint so that you can get that classic holding the gun pose. Uh, the ball jointed hips are usually pretty tight. Uh, one of the nicer things about the lack of die cast in this figure is that for overall it feels like a more balanced um, action figure. That It doesn't feel like no one part is too heavy. Whereas on this guy, you know, you pick him up and then his legs start to go together because the the weight of the legs is too much for the ball joint and the hips and other kinds of terrible things. And I'm actually going to show you a quick little technique that uh, I use to, to pose this guy a little more. Because of the way that the back plate um, locks in, you can actually pull it out a little bit because of there's the, the, this hinge right here for the the bottom of the uh, the swing bar that holds the legs. And now that you have a little bit extra clearance, you can actually get the leg past the wings. It's not an ideal situation, but um, I do think it's a pretty cool idea that they, I think they did design this intentionally to do that just for an extra, extra posability so that you don't have to use the, uh, the gear walk joint to pose it in uh, batteroid mode, which a lot of people do use that, but I always thought it looked a little awkward. I believe uh, in the show, the way the uh, the actual nose cone section here is actually attached to the chest plate as by a little track that's kind of hinged so that the whole nose section can sort of fold, uh, bend forward a little bit, kind of at a, like a chest joint. But uh, what this toy does is, is pretty close, so I feel that's a good approximation. Okay, so I'm going to take this guy out for a little bit, and I'm just going to do what a lot of people ask me to do, which is give you a scale comparison to something common. Some people said I should use, um, uh, you know, like a deluxe transformer or a G.I. Joe or something like that, but I'm going to go with a common household object. So we're going to go with a tape measure. Actually, uh, well, you can see it is bigger than a tape measure. Mm. You know, uh, this doesn't quite get the idea, so I'm going to say it's about, alright, it's, it's a little, 
less than three tape measures tall. Okay, so now you have an idea of how big this thing is in uh, real life. You know, these things are really useless because it's like, you know, I, I try to use the whole, like, the claw thing that they got going here, but it's like, I couldn't actually, like, hook this thing very well, but I guess I could, like, uh, maybe hook the gun pod and bring it closer to me, but, yeah, I don't know. What, what can you do with these things? So this has been a somewhat tortured and long retrospective on the first Yamato VF1 Valkyrie. Uh, this is the, I guess it's the 10th anniversary, I don't know if this one was specifically released um, 10 years yeah, to this day, but it, w it was around that time. And in the end, what is this toy's legacy? Um, well, besides the way the fins fold in the backpack. Well, I, th I think the important thing about this toy is that it was the first one to step out of the shadow of the venerable and uh, much-beloved Takatoku Valkyrie. And for you Transformers fans, that's, that's Jetfire. <laughs> that is Jetfire. Because the only other toy, or at least, um, again, fully transforming, kind of deluxe-sized toy, was the uh, 172nd scale uh, High Complete model, which was still a lot like the... Uh, the 155th, 5th, yeah. like the 155th scale toy, in, as far as construction went, goes. So this is the one that really took a step out of the shadow of the Takatoku. I mean, sure, maybe it took a step and then fell over, but hey, you know, you, you gotta make some progress. So this has been my uh, sentimental retrospective on the old VF1 Valkyrie toys. I guess they're old. I mean, if Retronauts can call the PS2 an old console, then I can call this a retro review. <laughs> so this has been another review for Collection DX, and um, just giving you a taste of the eternal torment of Valkyrie collectors when uh, somebody makes a new toy, and then a little while down the line they replace it with something that's even better. It'd be nice if they could just make one toy and sell it forever, but, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Although I will say, this this is probably going to be the, the definitive VF1 Valkyrie for a long time. At least, maybe for at least the next ten years. This guy never really was the definitive of anything, but, you know, this was the first toy that really got me into uh, serious collecting, so um, I have a soft spot for it, and I feel like I will always keep this guy. So, in the end, new Valkyries, fold your tail fins with pride knowing that your ancestor at least got that part right.